very excited for today's session. It's, it feels like it's been a long time since we won a webinar, so I'm glad to be running just the one this month, but it's gonna be a really strong and good webinar. So welcome everybody. Um, my name is Sarah Cawley, for those who've not met me. I'm DFI's community manager, and one of my roles is to run the DFI webinar series. So I'm delighted to be joined by four experts who have got many years of experience between them. They're gonna tell you a little bit more about how agricultural insurance could work and how digitization of that will actually make some impact in terms of scale. Um, just a quick reminder for everybody, we are recording the session. So if you do drop out or you do happen to uh, really enjoy the session and want to share it with your colleagues, we'll be sending you the link to the recording tomorrow. And also we are really wanting to hear your thoughts, questions. So please do put them in the Q&A function, which you'll see at the bottom of your Zoom screen. Um, and then at the last few minutes of this call today, we'll be looking through your questions and posing them to our panelists. So I want to say a big thank you to everyone joining us today. And thank you to Richard, Simon, Rose and Rishi for agreeing to be part of this webinar. Um, and I'm going to pass over to Rishi, who's going to moderate the session for us today. So over to you, Rishi. Great. Uh, thanks, Sarah. I almost decided to start talking whilst I was on mute. And, uh, <laughs> yeah, it's been plenty of webinar experiences uh, <laughs> has kicked in there. Uh, thank you so much. Um, good afternoon, uh, ladies and, and gentlemen. Um, my name is Rishi Raithatha. I work as an insights manager for the GSMA's Agritech program in London. And uh, today's webinar, which is run by Digital Frontiers Institute, is on agricultural insurance, particularly how uh, digitization can uh, lead to scale. So today's panelists can easily be thought of uh, as a list of who's who in the world of microinsurance. Now, if this were uh, an Oscars ceremony, each of them would be nominated for best director. Uh, in terms of who wins, well, that's your guess. They are uh, Richard Leslie, who is the CEO of Microinsure, and also the executive vice president of the microinsurance company, Rose Goslinger, who is the CEO of Pula, uh, which is an insure tech that provides index insurance across a number of uh, countries in Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as Simon Schwal, who's the CEO of OCO, an insurtech that currently offers uh, weather index insurance in Mali and Uganda. Uh, and as you already know, I'm ably assisted by uh, Sarah Corley, who's the Community and Professional Development Manager at the Digital Frontiers Institute in South Africa. Uh, before, I, um, can, before I continue with, uh, with uh, a round of questions for the uh, panelists, I just wanted to take a few moments to introduce the GSMA for those of you who don't know much about it. So the GSMA represents the interests of mobile operators worldwide, uniting more than 750 operators with almost 400 companies in the broader mobile ecosystem. This includes handset and device manufacturers, software companies, equipment providers, and internet companies, as well as any organizations in the, adjac in the adjacent industry. The, the GSMA also produces the industry-leading Mobile World Congress events held annually in Barcelona, Los Angeles, and Shanghai as well as the Mobile 360 series at regional conferences. Uh, within the GSMA, the Agritech program is part of uh, the Mobile for Development team, which drives innovation in digital technology to reduce inequalities uh, worldwide. Singularly positioned at the intersection of the mobile ecosystem and the development sector, Mobile for Development stimulates digital innovation to deliver both sustainable business and large scale socioeconomic impact for the underserved. The Agritech program specifically has a vision to achieve equitable and sustainable food chains that empower farmers uh, and strengthen local economies. Our mission is to bring together and support the mobile industry, agricultural sector stakeholders, innovators and investors in the Agritech space to launch, improve and scale impactful and commercially viable digital solutions uh, for smallholder farmers in low and middle income countries. And we do this through sharing research and knowledge on best practices, running an innovation fund and providing technical assistance and brokering partnerships. Um, today, the webinar uh, we've got for you builds on a recently published landscape report, which covers a number of trends, challenges, and opportunities relating to agricultural, specifically index insurance. Uh, in terms of trends, the report looks at how digitization and technology has led to growth in the number of digital insurance services available to smallholder farmers, and in particular, we show the impact of mobile technology on digitizing index insurance services. In terms of challenges, we explored data availability uh, as this remains a challenge with insufficient current and historical weather data coverage leading to 
uh, unexpected claim outcomes. Uh, at the same time, we also explored distribution payments and location accuracy, uh, which are barriers to scale, and we looked at how mobile can help to overcome these. Uh, in terms of opportunities, in terms of opportunities, uh, we looked at how mobile operators can improve service creation, contextualization, and delivery. And we uh, explored the use of partnerships, bundling, and cross-selling as means to achieve scale across a number of different model, uh, business model approaches. Um, from, uh, from the analysis we carried out, we came up with six key learning points. Uh, we found that index insurance services had enabled um, first-time access and usage for many uh, smallholder farmers. But we also found that despite some early promise, service adoption remains limited. Partnerships between insurance service providers and distributors, such as aggregators or mobile network operators, are vital for services to scale further, as well as to improve customer awareness, trust, and education. And in terms of business models, business to business remains popular, or I beg your pardon rather, business to government remains popular uh, due to government support schemes such as the premium subsidy scheme in Kenya. We did find that some providers have grown through business to consumer or business to business approaches, which I'm sure Rose and Simon can tell us more about shortly. Uh, we found that mobile technology can be used for service enablement and delivery. Uh, we've seen mobile technology being used for customer registration via USSD, determining a farmer's location via location-based services, providing regular weather updates via SMS, and collecting premiums and paying out claims via mobile money. That said, there is a sizable opportunity for mobile operators and mobile money providers to drive further growth of index insurance services. Finally, we found, that index, we found that index insurance should be bundled together with loans, as this would offer farmers loan protection and an income safety net. And the moment you've all been waiting for, uh, the very first question that I'd like to ask our panelists. So the first question is on uh, digitization and the in, in, index insurance landscape. And I wanted to put this first to, to Richard Leslie to, to tell us a bit more about how the landscape has, has changed where agricultural index is, is concerned over the last decade. Sure. Uh, thanks, Rishi. I mean, um, I'm, I actually think that Rose and, and Simon are probably now the experts in this area. I mean, as Mike Rencher and myself personally, um, I think we actually sold our first weather index insurance product in 2004, which is now 16 years ago. Um, but we actually stopped selling the products um, uh, about five or six years ago when we had some concerns over them. So perhaps, you know, um, I'm going to be more of the voice of, of reason and, and, and uh, perhaps Simon and Rose can kind of can spell out where, where they're going to go in the future with this. But certainly over the last, you know, over the last decade, we've seen huge change in the way in which the, the kind of digital landscape has, has affected agriculture uh, insurance. I mean, when, when we first started in 2004, and we started with kind of uh, using weather stations, so just analog weather stations that had been around for decades um, in Africa. Um, and, and often that, that meant that you had to actually go to the, to, the, to the location and you got out a big book and you had to actually, you know, physically hand write down all of the recordings going back decades and then digitize those yourself. Um, and I think the real turning point for us certainly is micro insurance, and, and, and this is, I think, before Rose even started working in, in Rwanda on it, um, was the realization that actually a lot of these weather stations just have fallen by the wayside. Um, I think it was actually when we first started working in Rwanda and we realized that kind of prior to the genocide in Rwanda, there had been over 200 weather stations. Um, and and after, the, after the genocide, there, there were, I think, only two or three that were left operational. And when you kind of play this out across Africa um, and Asia and many, many kind of emerging economies, you, you can see that actually this kind of network of, um, weather stations that are needed in order to kind of provide a, a the yeah the basis of 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 the index itself, but also the the decision about whether or not a, a claim is going to be payable. Those weather stations simply have you know fallen by the wayside. So we had to find other ways of of pricing products and then also um, determining whether a claim was paid. And 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 that of course led to people installing their own weather stations initially um, as kind of automated weather stations. I think a lot of us did that on on the masts on, on the masts of the telcos themselves because they had electricity and they had access to um you know to strong kind of signals to be able to send um you know to send data over sms um but you know increasingly that became it became obvious to us that that actually wasn't going to work and so we started to move into using kind of satellite data um in order to be able to kind of map out um 
both historically but also going forward um, whether there had been rainfall but of course that that was also a challenge um, you know what what a lot of people won't tell you is that um, you know the satellite data is great and it's it's a fantastic kind of resolution it tells you almost now to you know a few meters squared it can tell you what's going on on the ground but there isn't actually a, a direct data feed that tells you whether it's it's actually raining it, you know so you have to kind of like find some way of matching up the satellite data and then determining whether or not that satellite that that remote sense data actually tells you whether it's raining or not so so there's been these kind of big step forward um, you know that, that have happened in the industry almost out of necessity almost out of a kind of lack of analog data um, the industry had to go down a digital channel in terms of the data that it needed to be able to create these indices um, I think as well, um, there have been, and, and this is certainly something that I'd like to discuss later, um, almost kind of uh, an opportunity to use digital as a way of distributing these products. And I, and I don't think that that's what you meant by this question, but I think um, actually uh, the distribution of these products through digital channels um, is something which um, should have, but hasn't really taken off to the degree in which it should have done. Um, and so that's perhaps, perhaps something we can discuss as we go through the session. Great, thanks, Richard. And I mean, fair point about the distribution and potentially my question not looking at uh, covering that, but I'm, I'm very happy to try and understand a bit better for, for our audience, uh, the way digitization and what would have, uh, well, has, has improved distribution or, or could improve distribution. Um, the same question, I'd like to try and um, get an opinion from, uh, from Rose, if I can, at this point, uh, to, to give us a bit more of an understanding, especially um, give, given the work that you do. Sure. Um... Thanks, Rishi. Um, I think, you know, just following on with what uh, with Richard just said, uh, I would really kind of, I think we, when we started working on this, I remember getting in touch with Richard in 2007. So like nearly three years after they started and doing the first one in Rwanda, if I look at back at that, it was indeed very much like, you know, man held weather, man, you know, recorded weather stations, which were sometimes literally like a bottle in the floor. Um, and then going to automated weather stations. And then I would say circa 2011, everybody switched over to kind of satellite data because of the issues we saw with weather data. Um, but I would, I would echo like, you know, um, like ourselves as Pula, we pretty much switched over from pure weather index insurance to yield index insurance in 2015 when I started Pula. And I would even say that to some extent starting Pula, you know, one of the core features um, that we set out to do with Pula is actually to move from weather to really yield index insurance. What we saw while, you know, my co-founder is an actuary and he always says it's, you know, as actuaries, they love the complex formulas. The complex formulas, I felt, always gave us a false sense of security. And the reality was that we weren't getting, we were getting it wrong as many times as we were getting it right. And when we started doing yield measurements, you know, that's when we really started getting traction and, and reaching scale. Like we now as Pula, like in the last five years, we've insured over three and a half million farmers this year on track and insuring two million farmers as compared to one million last year. So we're really starting to grow when we, you know, by using this kind of more effectively more simpler product where you measure the yields. And digitization has certainly played an important role in that. Like in the past, you know, like these you know, satellite data, you know, it sounded, you know, it sounds like your silver bullet because you have it everywhere. You know, it's kind of this transparent data source. But if you think, you know, if you think through the detail, and the devil is always in the detail, if you think through the detail, how you set up these fairly complex formulas and that how you have to even explain those complex formulas to your end customer, which is a semi-literate farmer in most cases, or a very literate, you know, NGO or government institution that you're selling to, you know, they will still find that a very complex algorithm. Um, and, you know, the, you know, they're all fine when they're signing up the premium or when they're paying the premium, but when the payout doesn't happen as they expected, then they're not so friendly anymore. Farmers will stone you and ministries of government agencies will see it, you know, they won't, you know, they'll figure ways that you can never get into the country anymore or basically make sure that your whole business actually has a lot of trouble with that. Um, and so like when we switched to yield index insurance, that was really what we were trying to do. Um, we're really trying to solve for because I would say like, for people who are not familiar with that the difference between weather index insurance and yield index insurance is quite you know weather index covers for risks like drought pests like droughts and perhaps some excess rain and really relies on the idea that satellite data would measure you know through the availability of like cloud measurements you know like effectively most satellites or the precipitation satellites look at the temperature of clouds and if temperatures of clouds are, you know, they're very, they're very cold, they're likely to have rain. So they make an estimate of how much rain there is. But that estimate, it's an estimate. So they may be right. Um, but you know, like, 
they might as well also be wrong. Like, you know, the, the chances of them getting it wrong are, are you know, are, it's not bad, it's not fantastic, but, you know, there's, it's certainly an estimate. Um, then the complexity of setting up those indexes, you'd have to look at how much rainfall you need at particular times of season. We're just finding that it wasn't really working for us. Now, with yield index insurance, you know, it's, it's a much more old concept, I would say. It started in the 70s in India, where actually you measured, you know, like government extension officers were going out to the field and doing what they called crop cut estimates, where you actually, you know, harvest with the farmers and you set two boxes on the field. You literally, you know, like effectively you will, you know, have some guy walking, you know, with, you know, like a, a machete into the field and he'll cut the maize or he'll cut the rice you know, they'll thresh the rice, they'll thresh the maize, measure it, they come with a weighing scale and write down their number. Now, the key thing for us in digitization there has been that, you know, it, in the past, like in India and like that, and still actually, like those extension officers are all paper-based. So it's very difficult to actually monitor what's going on. We equipped our teams with, you know, with, uh, with tablets, digital weighing scales, with a whole bunch of different algorithms set up on the, on the back end to check for fraud, to check that these guys actually have been to the field, to check their GPS coordinates, to check that they're not entering faulty data. Um, but, you know, those kind of elements now make it possible for us to do probably more than 15,000 of those yield measurements into the, every year. And why this is really important is because yield measurements are really intuitive to customers, you know, to farmers alike. Somebody visited their farm, maybe not all of their farms, but somebody in the neighborhood will have been visited. And to like the governments and like the NGOs, the credit organizations that you're selling to, those organizations are now basically not trying to understand some complex algorithm. They just need to know, okay, in a normal year we get three metric tons and in a bad year we get one metric ton and we start paying from two metric tons. So you can come up with a fairly simple policy that most people can understand and therefore you have a lot less issues with that. So I'd say like for us, I you know, I would say like, since we do that yield index product, we don't have so much issues with our product anymore. We have much less basis risk, which is a big issue with weather index insurance. We still have some of it. Um, and we've been able, like we found kind of, you know, but it, it's much to a much lesser extent. Um, and I would say that's been really key for our kind of pure kind of product digitization and growth curve in that. Um, I would always like, I was also always kind of joke that this is kind of the rocket, like this always sounds like the rocket science, but as Richard really like rightly pointed out, um, the real rocket science is how you distribute this product, like, you know, how you get this product to your customer and how you use digital for that. We've tried a number of different things there. We've worked with seed and fertilizer companies bundled together with seed. Um, you know, the unit economics of that is really tough. And I wouldn't, wouldn't necessarily say that we've cracked the nut there. What really has worked really well for us is working together with credit institutions, governments, um, mobile operators that provide credit, you know, like getting that kind of bundling structure out there with operators that have potentially a wide digital network or a very non-digital network for that matter. But those are kind of the organizations that, you know, become your customers and help us get to numbers where we are now. Yeah. Yeah. No, that's, that's, that's fantastic. Thanks, Rose. I think I could, I could easily say you've answered a couple of questions in doing so. Um, but I will, we'll come back to the distribution element in a second, because uh, I think there is a question on, on business models and, and partnerships. Um, and I appreciate you talking about basis risk. Um, especially because we've had a question from the audience, which um, Richard has thankfully thankfully answered. Um, I just want to come to Simon now, and Simon, I've got a I've got a question on uh, for you, which looks at uh, index insurance not seeing the same type of growth uh, as life or or, or hospital cash uh, micro insurance. I guess this is a question for you, but also potentially for, for Richard and Rose as well. Um, and I wanted to put this to you first to see what you make of it. Sure, thanks. Um... Maybe if you allow me, I will just um, answer also your first question, give a, give a bit of my opinion. Um, because I think one thing that I see, and I haven't been in that field for as long as uh, Rose and Richard, so I, I'm kind of the newcomer here, but I think it is definitely there's more and more data available of uh, higher quality coming from satellite um, operators. Uh, so, and there's also more and more data on yield, so that's how even though we stay in the field of weather-based insurance, index insurance, that's how we reduce this risk by creating smart algorithms that link the weather conditions to the yield and reduce the, the, the basis risk this way. And this is definitely something that is that has developed in the past 10 years and that is continuing to, to develop. Um, so yes, second question, so on um, why has index insurance not seen the same type of growth as hospitalization or life insurance. I want to say up front that um, I don't think this is a question of demand. Uh, having worked before in both in, in life and health insurance with a company called Bima, and now in crop insurance, I can tell you that 
the need for crop insurance is very strong. Uh, stronger even than the need for life insurance that can be a concept that is difficult to grasp for, for some of the target uh, users. The risk of a bad season is on the mind of every farmer every year. So it's, not, it's definitely not a question of, uh, of demand for the product. So why, why a slower growth? I think first it's a business opportunity matter. It's easier to sell a product to urban customers uh, with higher income and who are usually more educated. Uh, so um, targeting uh, urban dwellers and selling them life and health insurance is easier. Um, it's a low hanging fruit almost. The second, the claim process is more complicated as uh, Rose rightfully explained. Uh, it takes more time to develop uh, the, the technology to, re to verify the claims, while with life and health insurance, it's as simple as uh, checking the, the certificate or the hospital release form. For crop insurance, you need to do remote assessment or on-field assessment, and it's often a brand new expertise, and less companies are investing in that. Finally, I think there's the experience of life insurance that's taught a thing or two to the industry. So while the growth was initially very quick, for life and health insurance. Um, some problems appeared later on, like regulation, the regulators uh, cracking down on some, um, some distribution channels that were not anymore accepted, uh, low retention rate, uh, customers dropping a lot, so uh, having to reinvest in acquisition all the time, and then the cost of distribution. So all this has taught, I think, the, the new uh, players that try to do the replicate the same thing in crop insurance to be less aggressive, but probably build healthier business models. So I don't think we'll see the same rapid growth that we saw with at the beginning of uh, life and health micro insurance, but it might also not be a bad thing because I think it's going to be a healthier growth. Great, Thanks. Thank, you. thank you for that, Simon. I just want to build on that by inviting, by inviting Richard uh, to, to comment on this, because I think, Richard, we've spoken a few times about uh, in, in, firstly, insurance being being a hard sell, and index insurance, particularly being an even harder sell. So, I wonder what your take might be on this. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, so, I mean, I, I think you've heard me say, Rishi, a few times that you know, no one really wakes up in the morning wanting to buy insurance. You know, none of us woke up this morning and thought, you know, what I really want to go buy insurance. And so, you know, if you're if you're from a low income or a middle income background, you really don't, you really do not wake up thinking that you want to buy insurance. Um, you know, people can understand the need for a loan. They might even be able to understand the need for a savings account, and they're certainly grateful to receive remittances. But when it comes to insurance, it's really a hard sell. And uh, my experience um, is, and I think the statistics bear it out, the, the fact that you're asking the question, which is why has weather insurance or agriculture insurance or whatever you want to call it, not taken off to the same degree as say life, health, and, and say accident. I think it's because basically, it's, a, it's, it's actually really, really a difficult product for the farmers to understand. I think um, there's this massive mismatch between what the farmers are willing to pay or what they perceive the product is worth and, what, um, and, and, and the actual price of the product. Um, you know, so, I mean, my experience has been time and again that the farmers do want this product. I agree with Simon that they are worried about um, the risks that they face. But I don't think that they're willing to pay the, the actual, you know, the, the, the actual risk rate, the actual kind of full price. And I think that's why you see time and again, you know, pilot tests littered across Africa and Asia of donors paying for, uh, you know, two or three or four years worth of, of these programs. These programs get launched, they get to 10,000 farmers, um, and then, you know, the money comes to an end and so does the program. Um, and... You know, I think that that's good evidence of, 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 of what I'm saying, which is that I think there's a mismatch, you know, unless someone is willing to subsidize these programs. And if you look at a country like India, you know, the government subsidizes 75% of the premium. And guess what? Uh, weather insurance is fairly, you know, is, it, it's not even good weather insurance. In fact, it's pretty bad weather insurance. Um, but it's, um, but it's, it's nonetheless kind of there and it's been there for years and it's serving millions of people. So... I think it's a really hard product to sell because it, it's quite complicated. I think that there is actually uh, this mismatch between kind of what the product costs and what the farmer's willing to pay. And I think as well, because it's a relatively expensive product um, compared to hospital cash. I mean, you know, these products cost, um, you know, a, a few dollars uh, for weather insurance. 
um, and you know you can get life insurance for three cents or six cents or a dollar. Um, you know, and so I'm, I'm, I'm not comparing the the relative value. I'm just saying in absolute terms, they're 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 you know in dollar terms, they're they're more expensive. And as a result, when you do embed them, and I agree with Rose that that's the way to go. But when you embed it into a loan or a farm input or a seed or, or fertilizer or whatever, it inevitably, after a period of time, it inevitably makes that loan or that input more expensive um, because it, you know because the the provider of that service the, the 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 lender or the provider of the seed or the fertilizer isn't willing to subsidize their loss of profit or subsidize the cost of the insurance forever and as a result eventually the cost of the insurance becomes known to the farmers and i think um, there's a number of examples that i've that i've seen over the years where you know, as soon as that becomes evident to the farmers, then the farmers switch to the cheaper loan without the insurance or the cheaper input without the, without the insurance. And I think that that's again evidence that there's this mismatch between, yes, farmers do want it, but they're not willing to pay for it. Um, and I think that that's at the heart of, of why we haven't seen the, the similar level of take up of these products. Fair enough. I suppose none of us did wake up this morning uh, looking to buy uh, in insurance of any sort, but most of us did wake up knowing that there'd be a webinar about insurance. So there is at least yeah. that. So well, there's I did an buy insurance this morning. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very the well. The government told me I had to. So. Okay, well, well, well done, Richard. Um, uh, well done for buying motor insurance there. Um, so, you know, there's a couple of interesting things you've hit on there. And um, one of the things was the, the issue with subsidizing uh, in insurance there. And We've seen time and again that uh, a number of a number of papers have come out and suggested that the best way to, to go about this is to bundle insurance with loans, because the the risk the rate of default is is likely to go down. I wonder if any of you have a comment on this before I move to the next question. Maybe I'll comment a little quickly. Uh, so the product that we sell in in Mali it's not subsidised. Uh, we managed to keep it at a fairly low rate, and uh, farmers are paying for because of it. Um, indeed, they need to see a value in it. So we are offering added value other than insurance, meaning easier access to loans, um, agricultural advice, these kind of things. Uh, but I think if the product is compelling enough, uh, we're starting to make the case that farmers are willing to pay the full price of insurance for it. It's a lot more difficult than in Uganda, for example, where it is subsidized by the state. But I wouldn't, I'm not as I'm still optimistic, I'm still confident that we can, that farmers uh, are, if they understood fully the value of the product, are willing to, uh, to pay for it, especially if it was built in a way that remains uh, affordable or give a good value for money. Great, thanks. Thanks, Simon, appreciate that. Um, the next question I wanted to ask uh, looks at the role that mobile technologies can play to, uh, to grow index insurance services further. And um, for, the, for the work that we did for the report uh, that we published, um, I spent a bit of time learning about the service that Pula, uh, which Rhodes leads, offers through, through Digifarm in, in Kenya. And that's a really interesting way of uh, a mobile-based agri value-added service platform offering uh, index insurance together with um, a bundle of relevant services. And I just wanted to try and get an opinion from, from, from you, Rose, at least to start off with, uh, as to how uh, mobile technology can be used in this particular case from the example you have to, to grow index insurance further? Um, in the case of Digifarm, like effectively how the program is structured, uh, Digifarm is a, it's a, it's a program where it's an enterprise um, within Safaricom, which is the largest mobile operator in Kenya. And effectively what they provide is they started off with providing like farmer advisory services to farmers then they started offering, um, let me see, they were serve, offering extension services, farmer advisory services. Then they started offering off-taker and credit services. Now, of course, like a Digifarm leverages off a huge and very strong network in, in Kenya where they already have like 65, 70% of the, the population is on Safaricom network. And like I would say 99% of all mobile money in Kenya, which comprises of 40% of GDP, which is so very huge outreach is, transacted through that same same platform. So it, it's good to understand what this is built because that's where a lot of the, the value comes from. So now Digifarm, like where Safaricom is offering a specific agricultural loan for and not provided in cash to farmers, but in return from inputs to farmers. And on top of that loan, they have added a insurance product to secure that loan. 
Now, they've not just decided that they want to secure the loan value. They said for this to, to really have value to farmers, we will not just finance an insurance that will cover the inputs so that we can get our loan back. No, we want, really want to secure the harvest income of these people. And that's pretty rare, to be honest. Like We see governments do that. Some of our governments might do that. But we don't necessarily see a lot of other organizations do that. Um, but to come to Simon's point, like farmers do, you know, do appreciate it because when it comes to a payout, the payout is much larger. So it's not a payout that just covers, gets them back to zero. It really kind of replaces some income that they would otherwise have, would have hoped to receive if they were actually growing the crop. Now, I think the premise of this product is very much you know, the, the context that I described it in. So you really have like this network where you, know, you get this loan for this insurance product. It's part of, an ins part of a loan bundle that you're getting. Um, but it's, it's, you know, there's also a lot of compel, like there, there's a lot of like um, push for you to also pay that loan because you want to stay on the network and the network is part of your basic payments platform for the country to pay anything, frankly. You know, I can, in Kenya, I can pay, uh, I can pay my bus fare with M-Pesa. I can pay the transporter with M-Pesa. I can pay anything with M-Pesa. So it's, it's built, really building on that network. Um, and so like also the algorithm for the loan takes some of that payment data into account. So there's a lot of like pieces that fit into this. I think insurance for them was really important because as they grow, you know, particularly as they grow their loan portfolio um, for Safaricom was really important to kind of grow that piece in there. I don't necessarily, look, as much as I, I love this program, I think it's amazing. And I think it, it has a lot of potential, particularly in a country context like Kenya. It took quite a bit of time for Safaricom to build and to have such a context within which you can launch something like that. You know, I think in other markets like, you know, in a country like Nigeria, uh, where we do a lot of work, I think there, there's another potential to like, you have a do very dominant mobile operator where something like that could definitely be developed. Um, so that's something that we're definitely interested in where we see potential growth. Um, I would say like the program with Digifarm like is trying to reach something like 200,000 customers this year. Uh, they had a bit of a hiccup when it comes to COVID, but you know, like apart from that, like I would say like that those are kind of like working with such like network players who, who have a very dominant space in the market and you can offer like kind of a really kind of high value product and can find a financing structure for that high value product that's really key um so yeah i don't know if you have any other things that you want me to bring up on that no that's 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 fantastic thanks it's um it's it's a really good example i think of the way uh, mobile technology has been used it, it's a bit of a unique example and i think at this point i'd like to to go to simon because your your service in mali is is, is equally unique where you've partnered with uh, Orange Money and you have your service embedded within their mobile money uh, menu. Um, so I was just wondering if you could tell us about that as, 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 and, and why that was the approach that, that you took to try and uh, scale, scale your service further. Sure. So um, as we said before, live and health insurance has been very successful when it was, abandoned, when it was accessible from, from mobile devices. So the idea behind OCO from the beginning has been to replicate the same distribution model that worked for life and health insurance and bring it to, uh, to crop insurance. And I think uh, mobile technology can be used in the same way, meaning distributing via mobile channels like SMS, voice calls, but also USSD. So USSD is this, is this uh, mobile money menu, for example, that Orange Money has. Uh, so being able to be in this menu uh, gave us a lot of visibility, makes, it, uh, makes insurance uh, available to anyone who has a phone. Uh, so this is a very strong um, quality of our product that is really universally accessible because we have this partnership with the mobile operator, because we are accessible from any device, regardless of internet connection, regardless whether it's a, it's a smartphone or a feature phone. Um, so that's um, we believe that it's a strong prerequisite for the success of the product is to make it universally accessible. Um, so yeah, this, this um, mobile distribution channels are key uh, to, to grow index insurance further. But then we realized as well that there are other things that need to be added um, more that don't necessarily exist for life and health insurance. For example, uh, the target population, as uh, Richard said, and so was, I think, are the target population is often literate and text-based interfaces don't necessarily work for them, for them. So we are starting to implement innovations such as an interactive voice menu or a voice note, voice note based chatbot that help these customers um, access, uh, interact with us in a manner that is more um, convenient to them, to them because they cannot necessarily type or write in the, uh, in the for example, in French, in Mali, but they can definitely send a voice note 
if they have WhatsApp. And uh, we see that um, about 30% of our customers are using WhatsApp. Um, when we talk about mobile technology, I think there's another way that could help grow index insurance further. And that's, but that's on the network side. So in absence of GPS, many of our customers don't have smartphones. Uh, mobile operators could offer users to share the, lo the location using signal triangulation. That could help us a lot to onboard customer because a precise location is really key to reducing the basis risk that we mentioned before. That could be uh, that can be one way. Another way could be that uh, mobile operators could provide uh, accurate weather data, either with weather stations attached to their mobile base towers, or by analyzing the the signal. And uh, by analyzing the signal, you can see what's the moisture in the air, so they can provide additional data uh, in addition to what is available via satellite. Uh, so this is not something that we can do ourselves because it, uh, we need to have uh, access to the network itself, but uh, it's something that mobile operators can do to help uh, grow index insurance and make it better and more accessible. Yeah, that, thanks Simon. Those are some really, really good examples of uh, how mobile technology can be used. And um, you know, when you talk about providing uh, location locations to try and minimize the basis risk, I do believe there are one or two examples where this is being used, but it is something that we, we in our report try and, uh, well, we're trying to encourage uh, that to be rolled out a little bit further. I don't think you necessarily need to even have GPS through a smartphone. It's something that I believe is already being done by a couple of uh, service providers who are using uh, location-based services through, through USSD itself. Um, it's probably you know, in cases where accuracy is often questioned, they've said, well, you know, it, we, we either have an idea or if we don't have a good idea, then we have a rough idea and often that, that's good enough for us. Uh, but there are ways of improving this and this is something that we go into, into detail in our report. I think the other thing that you mentioned about having accurate weather data, yes, this is absolutely fundamental uh, for, weather insur for weather index insurance in particular. And we look at the use of automated weather stations uh, in our report, but beyond that, uh, and I believe that we've talked about this a few times, we've, we're, we're running a project to try and understand whether commercial microwave links, which are the signals that are transmitted between uh, different base stations, um, whether this data can be used for, for rainfall monitoring. We've run a couple of pilot projects in, in Sri Lanka, in, in Nigeria, uh, and in Bangladesh. And, and through this, we found that um, uh, the temporal spatial nature, nature of, of uh, of these uh, microwave links could be translated into very accurate uh, rainfall maps, which give you a good idea of the depth and the intensity of rainfall. Rose mentioned that when you look at satellite data, you look at the cloud and there's no, there's no guarantee it's raining, but at least we know that from this data, when, uh, when, when it rains, uh, the rainfall attenuates these signals and you have a pretty decent idea of, uh, of, of the intensity and depth of rainfall. Um, I, do, I do appreciate um, the examples that you've both given me about the, the strength of um, pa partnerships with mobile network operators because there is there is the networking effects there that you can take advantage of um, and I know Richard you mentioned distribution very early on when we when we started the webinar I wonder if you've got you've got a take on the, the use of mobile technology for distribution because I think this is something that you have done with uh, some of your some of your products before sure um, I think we I think probably to, to some extent all of us have um, uh, on the panel so but um, yeah um, I mean look m m mobile phone companies are immensely powerful ways of distributing uh, insurance because people trust their mobile phone company um, the reason that people trust their mobile phone company by the way is because they top up um, they top up their phone with airtime and it works and they do that regularly right so they buy small amounts of airtime they top up their phone and it works and so in their mind, they equate Safaricom or Orange or Vodafone, uh, even subconsciously, they trust those brands. So they, they're willing to send money through Safaricom because they, they have done so many, many times and it's always shown up with their friend or you know, paid the bill. And so because it works, they believe that it will work. And so when that brand turns around and says, if you die or if you get sick or if your crops fail, uh, we will pay you this money, then they have absolutely no reason to question whether or not it will work. Um, whereas um, if, um, if other brands like, you know, like our brands like Pula or Microinsure or Oco or, or Beamer or whoever, I mean, frankly, no one knows who our brands are and that's why we've been leveraging these other organizations' brands. Um, and frankly, no one trusts the insurance companies. And the reason they don't trust the insurance companies is because they don't have that frequent interaction with 
um, with an insurance company, right? So we trust brands that we use and that have proven to be trustworthy. Um, we go upon, you know, past history as a good guide of what, what might happen in the future. And that's why um, a lot of us have, have leveraged this kind of inherent embedded trust into these brands as a way of distributing insurance because it's a really intangible product. Um, it's also enabled us not to necessarily sell insurance, but to actually sell um, a solution to people's worries, right? So if you, if you stand on a street corner in Nairobi and say, who wants to buy life insurance? I can assure you that the queue will be extremely short. Um, but if you stand on the street corner in Nairobi and say, uh, does anyone want to make sure that their child finishes school if something bad happens to them, then there'll be a long queue, right? And so people, people want to find a solution to something that they're worried about. Um, and, and so, you know, I don't know how Rose and, and um, Simon represent their products, but I'm pretty sure that there's an element of, you know, not needing to call it necessarily insurance, I mean, apart from maybe for legal reasons uh, or compliance reasons, but actually it's a solution to a problem that the farmers are worried about. And, and so when you combine that with the brand of a telco, um, it's a very powerful proposition. Um, okay, thank you for that. And just whilst I've got the mic, Rishi, I know that you're from the Amagri team and therefore when you talk about index insurance, um, you're talking about um, weather index or, or, or yield index insurance products, you know, products that relate. But, but actually, I think we're starting to see a micro insurer uh, and now at the micro insurance company, we're starting to see that index insurance is actually something which could be used for, um, for non kind of agriculture products. So um, a lot of people um, in the countries that we work in, especially places like the Philippines, worried about things like windstorm. Um, so, you know, uh, typical kind of use cases, um, you know, a, a Filipino maid working in the Gulf, sending money home to her family every, every month. Uh, and, and a lot of, and good part of that money is being used to build a fa you know, a family home um, so that when, you know, 10 or after 10 years or 15 years, she can go home and she's got, you know, that's basically her retirement property. Um, and, and if that is damaged by a windstorm and, and, and the Philippines is affected by 20 typhoons on average a year, then, you know, there's a big issue for her. And so, um, you know, there's a strong demand for insurance products, which use say an index approach to cover assets that aren't necessarily just crops. So I think that there's a role there for mobile technology in actually being able to sell uh, and run those products in the future as well. And it's certainly a space that I think you should keep an eye on. Yeah, thanks. So that's, a, that's a fantastic example. And we've spoken uh, a few times, not just about um, storm or, or typhoon insurance, but also the fact that you can have a farmer with a large family and uh, with the onset of climate change, you'll have diseases occurring at, um, at uh, unusual times of the year, which bring on uh, uh, health problems. And so it's not just a case of looking at index insurance or agricultural insurance, but potentially a need for, for health insurance for farmers to be, to be bundled together with, with index insurance. And it is something that we're, we're looking into uh, as, as things go on. Um, for the sake of time, I'm going to move on to uh, my final question of the webinar. And uh, this explores the use of business models um, and specifically which, which kind of business model approach we, we think will, will lead to and, and sustain medium to long-term growth. And one of, the, one of the interesting things for me where this question is concerned is I'm sat with, with you guys virtually, of course, um, here. And I know, Simon, your, your service is, is, is a business to consumer uh, business model, has, has got a business to consumer business model approach. Rose, you've, you've got probably both business to consumer and business to business, ultimately to consumer. And I wanted to try and um, throw this out to, to the two of you first before I then perhaps invite Richard to at the end uh, to give us a bit of an idea as to what you think the right approach might be to see, uh, see and sustain uh, medium to long term growth. Perhaps, Rose, if you, if you care to go first. Sure, no problem. Um, I would say we initially started off with kind of business to consumer approach. I, I remember my first project when I worked at the Syngenta Foundation, which later became like Acre Africa. Um, and, and we found that we just couldn't make the unit economics work uh, and the profitability. And so like for us, like the long-term sustainability, like I, I've gone back and forth a couple of times and, and ventured into like looking from business to business to consumer and going to the consumer directly. The the short of it was that always going business to business was always much more profitable. Our margins just worked. Whereas every time we tried to make the margins work and going to the consumer, you know, we just were hemorrhaging money. Um, so like, I think for like in the long term, like for our business, like I, we're not trying to run an NGO, like I, we're raising like this, you know, good amounts of like venture capital at this point. Um, you know, 
the business model for that, the profitability for that really works much better with a business to business model because you can get to scale. You can get the renewals are, you know, you're not doing individual renewals. You're doing renewals of 500,000 farmers at the same time, 200,000 farmers at the same time. You can manage, I saw a couple of the asked questions in their thing. People ask, you know, how do you do these yield measurements and how do you make sure, do you have to measure everybody's yield? How do you use samples? So like it's really a statistics game. So you, you have, you organize the country into different agroecological zones and then you sample the farmers per agroecological zone. So you can make those economics really work if you have, if you're working from like aggregator level. And like we've built like different business models around that to protect, you know, like we collect our own data and it's pri private data rather than public data that gives us a level of protection. Um, we increasingly integrate into insurance companies so that we also take a profit margin on the underwriting uh, or take an underwriting profit margin. Um, so there's a number of different ways that you can make that business model work because, you know, in agriculture and in microinsurance, the margin is always going to be thin. So you have to, you, ha you really have to squeeze at every single point. I actually be super curious, you know, how Simon is doing with the, you know, putting like in particularly in the Mali model where you put it on the, the, the menu. I, I never close out that we still might go that way. But I'm, I'm curious, like, because it's like, I, I would beg the question, it kind of comes back to, um, to Richard's question, if you just put it on the menu, do people in the end end up buying it? Because people might click on it. But the question is, do they end up paying the money? And in my experience, they, you know, as, as I said, like the, the, the queue becomes very short, you know, and over time, as you get towards the end of your menu, like people don't really sign up. Whereas if you're working with kind of like larger organizations, larger corporates, that's really worked for us. Like, yeah. And I would say, like as final point, I always kind of underestimated that market. I thought that market was very limited, um, but I'm increasingly seeing that if you, you know, understand the market well enough and have a very structured, vigorous sales process behind that, that that market is actually quite big. Great, thank, thanks, Rose. I think that's that's a great segue to, to Simon, really. Sure. Um, so yeah, at OCO, we took a slightly different approach. Um, we decided to go very early on uh, with a B2C model, partnering with mobile operators. Um, so we think that this B2C model is indeed challenging. Uh, you need to have a lot of customers before you can cover the cost and generate profits. But the benefit that mobile operators bring is that they have a reach that is second to none in most markets. So they offer almost an unlimited pool of potential customers. It's not as easy as just putting it in the menu and uh, getting customers to subscribe for it, uh, unfortunately. You need to also invest in having um, a team of agents and a call center to create a, a bond with the customers, to explain personally how it works, to convince them to, uh, to just to, to raise awareness about insurance. So it's not easy, definitely, but um, we see, uh, we have had very quick growth just after our launch. We had tens of thousands of customers who called us to try to get more information and to subscribe. So uh, we see a lot of potential. Um, and while partnering with uh, loan providers and uh, input suppliers makes a lot of sense uh, and, uh, in terms of potential synergies as well for the farmers, and I'm very admirative of all the work that, uh, that Rose has, has been doing. Um, it also means that for farmers, it cre creates a prerequisite to access insurance. It means that you need to take a loan if you want to have insurance, you need to buy seeds from a specific uh, provider if you want to have insurance. So we are making a risky bet because indeed we, we have to invest initially in customer acquisition before we can see profit in the long term. Um, but the fact that we are universally accessible and that we have that, that access to all these customers, we believe that eventually we'll, uh, we'll have more potential for growth. Um, that being said, we also work uh, with some companies uh, to bring insurance to their providers, for example, in agro industries, like uh, breweries, let's say, who collect who buy barley from uh, uh, local farmers. We help them, we have a deal with uh, AB InBev, they are a great partner of us, um, and we bring insurance to their farmers, but here as well, they appreciate the fact that we bring the uh, last mile delivery and that we have a solution that allows farmers to, uh, to access insurance themselves. Uh, second thing I would like to add is that when you ask what type of business model uh, is likely to, to, to succeed, I think it's quite important to focus on, uh, on a healthy growth, once again, and to have a good retention rate if you want to be successful in the long run. Otherwise, what we've experienced as well in live and health insurance is that you keep uh, investing in recruiting customers just to replace the customers that are leaving your service. 
So have quite creating a quality service, a uh, good um, bond with your customers, a good customer relationship uh, is key uh, to, uh, to succeed in the long run. Otherwise, people might try it to, to test it initially, but if they see that it doesn't pay one or two seasons in a row, they're going to, to leave. So, um, yeah, it's not just as simple as B2B or B2C, it's also about how much value you bring to the customers, uh, creating this relationship, creating this brand image uh, that will make uh, make the grow sustainable in the long run. Um, yeah, re really good point there on uh, making sure that you're not recruiting new customers to replace uh, outgoing customers. Uh, and that's where I'd like to, to bring in Richard to try and understand a bit more about, uh, from your experience, you know, how have you continued, how have you managed to continue offering continuous uh, or sustainable value to, 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 to customers uh, from the medium to the long term? Well, I mean, we, we stopped doing weather insurance uh, in 2014. Um, so maybe I'm not the right guy to ask. <laughs> we did it for 10 I guess years. I the webinar was over then. Uh, well, no, we did it from 2004 to 2014. I think the turning point for me was um, was a fairly well known and Rose will have a small smile on her face events in Rwanda where, um, where I think, you know, the, the, we, we launched a program which ended up um, subsidizing the creation of the product, subsidizing the premiums of the product, and then, and then having to subsidize the, the, the claims actually itself. So it was like, this was a totally unsustainable, um, and, and still our reputation was completely shredded. So, um, you know, it, it, it really didn't strike me that there was really any upside of doing these products. Um, you know, I mean, I think though that, you know, having said that, I do see that these products can work. And I, and I really, you know, have been, and, and I hope Rose would, would agree with me have been a, a huge um, supporter and fan of Pula and anyone you know Simon others that are doing these kind of products I'm I'm really happy to kind of you know when someone asks me about you know we want to do weather insurance I point them in the direction of Agritosh or or Rose or Simon and say you know that these are the people that you want to speak to my personal view is that um, these products um, you know it, it, this is a distribution challenge and I and I and I'm really you know, I know that I share that view with, with many other people. I think that one of the ways that you could try and make it a bit more appealing is to try and have it um, kind of bundled in with some other product which, which, which people seem to like. So my experience has been that they, they seem to like um, health insurance because they think that that, you know, health insurance or hospitalization is something that they're going to use. And so, you know, packaging it in with something which they think is more tangible, like health, um, you know, and selling it as a package might be one way that, that could be looked at it. Um, but I do think that, you know, there's strong evidence that says that um, these programs work really well um, when they're kind of done on a kind of PPP basis. I mean, you know, certainly it's a pain in the backside getting governments aligned. It takes a long time. There's a huge potential for, dare I say it, corruption. Um, you know, if we're being honest, then that, that's the truth. Um, and, you know, that those things can be very, very off-putting, especially for a, a relatively small startups, because we're in a hurry and we don't really want to wait around for years and years for governments to make decisions. But when those things do happen, then that's certainly a way that you've seen these these products kind of get to scale because governments have then pushed them and provided subsidy and provided the environment to enable these things to to really get to massive scale. Personally, um, you know, I stopped selling these products because I just it was just too hard, really. Um, I, it's not a, I, I totally agree with Simon. There is strong demand from farmers. They do want the product. I don't doubt that. Um, uh, but it is just a really, you know, insurance is difficult. I know that myself. Uh, I've been doing it for 20 years. Um, and weather insurance is by far the hardest. Um, that, you know, so anyone who's willing to do it, I take my hat off to them. But um, I gave up uh, six or seven years ago. Well, with, uh, with that from Richard, I think we should take our hats off to, to Simon and, and Rose, I guess. Uh, but before, before we, we come to an end, there are a couple of questions uh, from the audience. And uh, there's one from, from Ali Jaffrey, which goes, uh, goes to Rose. So I'll just read the question out. The question is, crop yield is dependent on a number of variables. Uh, how you determine that low yield is because of farmer practice, uh, soil, seed, or, or other factors. Um, and I wonder if uh, you've got you've got uh, a take on that there, Rose. I've got to manage the different pieces of unmuting and answering the question at the same time. Okay, so like what we what we do is is like uh, like our basics of our yield insurance product is that we don't have to um, we don't 
actually you know visit every individual farmer but we will sample farmers and that you know our the underlying assumption is that you know if something happens to your specific farm for example you know um you know let's take the point you didn't all take all the best care of your farm or you had a very specific event on your farm that's not probably something that you can manage yourself rather than a systematic event that insurance would cover we have a certain we have a basis risk command fund in place that covers for really kind of you know edge cases where something completely out of control only happened on your farm you know lightning striking like literally that kind of case um, but most of the time we would sample. So, and what we find is that when we sample, you know, there might be a hurricane, for example, somewhere, and we will see that all these farmers in Southern Malawi were hit by this hurricane and all of them had a flood and as a consequence, all of their yields reduced. Um, so that's, you know, it's really a question of sampling and statistics that helps us measure for and like control for individual farm management issues. Um, I don't know if that helps your question, but that's how we do it. Yeah, that's, that's absolutely fine, thanks. And um, there's a question from uh, Jill Lagos Shemin, who, who's, who's very happy to hear about uh, Pula's story uh, and remembers the Syngenta days. Um, but one thing she, uh, she believes that the audience might benefit uh, hearing from is, is about markets where um, an insurance service provider can't partner with a mobile operator. Um, and, and this is an interesting question because I remember being on on a, on a DFI webinar a, a month or two ago, asking the same question to, to Hollard Insurance. So, um, you know, I'm going to leave this open. Whichever of you wants to take it is absolutely fine by me. Okay. So I, I would say, like, um, I'm happy to kind of, like, most of our partnerships and our, like, I think only in Kenya do we have a mobile partnership. And Nigeria is our largest market, for example. Um, so I actually think it's not... And in, by the way, in Nigeria, there are no agricultural subsidies either. So it's, it's, I think it's perfectly possible to work in a market without agricultural subsidies or a mobile operator. But you will need an alternative distribution channel that works well for you. Um, you know, we've worked with the government of, uh, like, you know, coming to Richard's points, you know, some startups have, like, you know, you don't have, uh, you don't have the patience to work with governments. At this point, we know how governments work. Like, you know, it takes us 14 to 18 months to get something done. Uh, but then you have sustainable scale as well. So we've just kind of realized, okay, if that's going to be our route to scale, that has to be our route to scale and let's get on with it. So let's have conversations with like 40 governments at the same time. Let's move this needle forward. And I, I think you can work with that, but you have to make a, a really deliberate decision to go that route then. Um, you know, because like, as you said, like, you know, the pool through MNOs may be very, you know, maybe very deep, but it, it's, you know, it's tough if you, if you can't keep your clients. Whereas if you work through a government channel, it's so much, you know, it's, it's from that perspective, I'm the lazy one in this group here. Well, I, would, um, I would complement this. Like, um, yeah, I think if you don't have a strong MNO that you can partner with, you need to find another partner that can provide the same reach and also a way to collect the premiums. So it can be, for example, um, Let's say in India, it could be something like Paytm, which is an app that is used by millions of people for, uh, for, for, to, to pay for goods and services. Um, in Latin America, for example, we're talking with a bank in, uh, in Colombia uh, that is in touch with millions of farmers and they already have this transactional relationship. Uh, in Nigeria, um, yeah, it can be an input provider. It could also be an app because mobile money is not that strong in Nigeria yet, but there are apps such as uh, Cellulant or, or others that have a strong reach and uh, this ability to, uh, to collect premiums. So I think there are other potential partners, uh, but it's really then market specific. Great, thanks, Simon. I, I'm looking at the time and I believe we're on the hour and uh, with, uh, I think there's one more question. There's another question and I'll entertain this for the sake of for the sake of having it uh, answered. Um, again, from, from Jill about um, the branding that was being spoken about with regards to mobile operator, uh, mobile network operator branding. Um, and the question is, is, is there an impression upon, upon all of you that Nigeria is a really unique market in that way, where uh, branding and, and uh, mobile operator partnership is concerned? Happy for any of you to take this. So I, I think Nigeria, yeah, we're not in Nigeria, so I'll let Rose complete my, my answer. 
Um, but branding is, uh, is super important indeed. Um, I think it's possible to create a brand that is appealing to customers, um, even if it's if you're not using the brand of the mobile operator. Um, it, it's uh, yeah. So I don't know about Nigeria specifically. I think it's uh, possible to uh, to create a brand that is recognized. Um, yeah. Now let uh, Sarah almost complete. Great. Well, if there are no further questions, um, I'd like to thank all the participants for attending and for their questions, and the panelists, uh, Richard, Rose, and Simon, for, for attending. Thank you so much for your time and for answering the questions, and I'd also like to thank uh, Sarah and Digital Frontiers Institute for being so kind uh, to host this webinar. Sarah, over to you. Thank you so much, Rishi, and thank you also to Richard, Simon, um, and Rose. It's been a really interesting session. You know, for me, we know that there's demand out there. We know that people would be very, it would be very beneficial for people's financial resilience to have insurance, but it is a hard sell. And I'm really pleased that we heard different approaches that you're taking. So B2C as well as B2B, and you've given us some really good tips and hints and ways we can do this, how to distribute. Um, you've given us a really broad overview. And I think you asked some fantastic questions, Rishi. So I really appreciate all of your input today. I know I enjoyed the session. I'm pretty sure all of our participants did. So thank you very much, everybody. And uh, we look forward to seeing you all soon.